Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you very much for joining this virtual event live. And thank you to those of you who are watching this event on recording. This event is the first in an IFPRI seminar series on food and fertilizer price trends, impacts on global food security. We'd really like to hear from you and to participate in our question and answer session that will follow the panel discussion. Please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using a hashtag, um, hashtag AskIFPRI on Twitter. I'm Leanne Jackson. I'll be your moderator today. I work as the head of the Agri-Food Trade and Markets Division at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I'm really pleased to be here to be part of this event. Um, we have six very rich presentations that are covering um, uh, current events in global commodity markets and input markets. Um, and we're, our plan is to make sure that we have enough time at the end of all these presentations for Q&A. So again, I really hope that you'll um, participate through the various channels that I mentioned. So now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor over to Yo Swinnen, who's the Global Director, CGIAR Systems, Transformation Science Group, and Director General of IFPRI, to make some opening remarks to welcome you to this event. Yo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leanne, and, and thank you very much for hosting, for chairing the event uh, together with us today. Um, this, uh, welcome everybody. I think today's events really doesn't need an introduction. I mean, the issues we will just be discussing have been around for a long time. They've had gained, they gained prominence up and down over the years. For example, we had uh, a lot of attention to these issues. And I think most people remember in 2007, 2008, when global prices spiked on the, on, on the markets and then actually discontinued until uh, 2011. Then uh, in the early days of COVID-19, there was a lot of turmoil on the market, again, uh, attack, attracting a lot of attention. And now, as all of you know, the invasion of Ukraine and the consequences of that have upset uh, global markets and which potentially enormous implications for global food security. Um, we have, as Leanne already said, we have a, a great lineup of speakers. They are be addressing several uh, complementary issues. And so it also reflects the, the, the complexity of the issues and the many factors that are involved. It relates to the economic and technological factors on the on the output markets, on the commodity markets. Uh, markets uh, input markets are going to be heavily affected or are already heavily affected. So it's important to really look at that aspect in, in greater detail on the fertilizer market, the fuel market, and that link to the transport and the energy market. Uh, to do this well, to analyze this well, I think we need to collaborate. Okay, I'm, I'm really extremely proud of the work that IFRI researchers have done over the past week in very quickly uh, coming up with early analyses of, of things, uh, gaining a lot of uh, attention also in the global media, but clearly to analyze that we have to work with a lot of institutions, uh, colleagues, etc. And today's lineup reflects that we have colleagues from, from OECD, Leanne was chairing, from USDA, from CIMIT, other CGIR centers from the World Bank, IGC and NASA. And so with that, I'm going to not use up more time here. I really look forward to the contributions and the insights of today. And I just want to thank uh, one more time the, the CPA team, the communications team of IFPRI for having put this together in a very short time. So thanks very much and uh, over to you, Leanne. Thanks so much, Yo. Um, and also reminding us of the importance of collaboration in this moment where things um, tend to seem rather chaotic. Um, so to kick us off, we have remarks on grain and oilseed markets, um, and they will be jointly provided by Seth Meyer, who works as the chief economist at the United States Department of Agriculture, and Joe Glauber, who's a senior, senior research fellow at IFPRI. So I'll pass the floor over to you two, um, and you can kick us off. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, um, I'm Joe Glauber. And uh, Seth and I have uh, uh, decided to try to split this up. Um, I think, as Yo was saying, uh, we actually started planning the seminar uh, uh, two or three weeks ago prior to the invasion. And so already at that time, uh, uh, prices were, were approaching record highs for many commodities. And we thought it was a real good time to start talking about food prices again and then of course the the invasion came and uh we've been scrambling to 
get on top of that. We decided to split the presentation. Seth is in a very awkward position in the sense that USDA comes out with their forecasts later today. So he won't be able to talk about any of that, but he does can talk very uh, knowledgeably about what has gone on. So I'm gonna pass the floor to Seth and uh, you can talk about what's brought us to this point. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Exactly. So our, our report, uh, our first post-invasion report comes out at noon. So if we can go to the first slide, um, we can go forward and say, you know, I, I really want to emphasize that, that, that this is our look with, within, we presented this look 12 hours before the invasion. And, and so this is really a look about how we got here. And as DG Swinnon indicated, it isn't as if this all happened overnight. We'd seen, we've seen this beginning in about 18 months uh, we've seen commodity prices rising. And you can look here and you can look at the main commodity markets of like corn, soybeans, and wheat over the last several years. And this is global production and global consumption. So if production exceeds consumption, we add to stocks. And if consumption exceeds production, we draw down stocks. And you can see that, you know, generally speaking, markets have bounced around between 2015 and 2019 sometimes building stocks, particularly in wheat, where we built stocks almost every year in this period. But we find ourselves in um, the somewhat unique position of being tight, corn, soybeans, and wheat as we enter this, uh, as we enter this coming season. Next slide. And again, it isn't as if this has happened overnight. When we look at prices for wheat, corn, and soybeans, and this graph ends when I gave this presentation on February 23rd, you can see that we saw global, we saw soybeans and corn prices in particular start to rise in the fall of 2020. We had had some depression of demand for some of these commodities as we sorted demand out through COVID, and demand really picked up. China came into the market, world global ag market very strongly in the fall of 2020. Uh, other countries held their positions very strongly despite rising prices. Global markets really tightened up, led by corn and soybeans, and really draw, dr uh, drug wheat along. Wheat prices were rising simply because of commodity price competition. Then we come to the summer of 2021, and you know, wheat grew its own legs, so to speak, and prices for wheat began to rise pretty substantially. There were questions about the size of the Russian crop. We saw the Russians take export controls through uh, taxation of their exports. That put the market on edge. And so wheat was providing its own price support at that time. And so we really have seen, at, and then most recently, we've seen South American concerns about soybean crops add to that. So we really have seen at different periods each to these each events adding some pressure to global commodity prices. Next slide. And so here again, the latest pre-invasion issue that we had dealt with is we were looking at in February, USDA had already taken 21 million metric tons off of the size of the South American soybean crop. That was the latest issue, which had continued to provide some support. And when we made that forecast, we were also entering into some of the key development stages for that crop. So that is one of the things we will continue to evaluate and you will see today. And also the market will look forward and look at uh, how the corn crop in South America looks as well too. The market will be very sensitive to ongoing developments of crop production. Next slide. And another way to look at this is ending stocks in terms of days of use. And it's ex-China, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, Chinese stocks are both uncertain and not directly accessible to the market, right? So when we think about how can the market respond? And yes, these lines look somewhat flat, but one can pick out a few key elements. And, and DG Swin points back to 2010 and 2011. And we can also think about our own drought in North America in 2012 and 2013. And you can see that in terms of days of use that we're running at, we're back down to those levels that we saw when we had this uh, you know, history of co real concern about uh, commodity prices in the global market. With the exception of rice, where we've continued to build global stocks, rice has almost been to the exception of this and has been pulled along a little bit in terms of prices, but not because of inadequate stocks. The situation in the rice market has been far less volatile because of that production. Next slide. 
And another aspect of this, you know, we tend to focus on, on uh, oil seeds when we think about bulk commodity shipments, but absolutely another element that we have seen is vegetable oil production, obviously an important element for uh, developing country consumers. And we've seen production problems here and rather robust demand supporting prices more recently as well too. Another key element in understanding how commodity prices, you know, there are each of these palm is straight oil, the rest of these products, there's a crush involving meal and oil, but we have seen vegetable oil rising very strongly, again, on some supply disruptions and pretty robust global demand. Next slide. That's you, Joe. Okay, I'll take it from here. Uh, thanks very much, Seth. So you can see we, we entered into the, the events of uh, when, when uh, the invasion started at already record high levels. You can see what the future prices have done since then. We uh, increasing over 70% for the nearby contracts. This is a May 2022 contract uh, for Chicago wheat. Kansas City wheat looks very, very similar. Uh, similarly for corn up uh, uh, 20% and soybeans even up 10%. Next slide. Part of that is because Ukraine is such a big uh, producer, has grown. You know, the, 30 years ago, uh, as the former uh, Soviet Union, or after the breakup of the uh, former Soviet Union, those areas were, were actually importing grain. But you can see the growth that they've had over the last uh, uh, 30 years or so to becoming a, just a, a juggernaut when you talk about uh, things like wheat exports, 30 some odd percent of wheat coming out of both Russia and, and Ukraine together. Uh, in terms of wheat, uh, roughly uh, Ukraine exports around 16 to 17 million tons a year. That's about nine to 10% of the market. They're very big in barley market where they supply about 13% of the market, corn market about 17%. So really after the US and, and Brazil, um, Ukraine is really one of the, the, the more important markets. And when you bring Russia into it, you can see just why this is considered one of the, the great bread baskets of the world. They uh, supply almost 12% of total calories uh, imported in over the world. Next slide. And you can see where these are all shipped. Now, it's important to remember that, that a lot of these, these countries are highly dependent on particularly things like imports of wheat from, from Ukraine and Russia. But it's also the point that Globally, prices are rising. So, so high prices affect all countries uh, to the degree that those countries' prices are integrated into world markets. But in particular, countries that are, are heavily dependent on a wheat being sourced from Ukraine. So you consider the North, North Africa and Middle East, where those countries are, are consume a lot of wheat. It, wheat composes a lot of their, their local diets that they are... Uh, um, and, and a lot of that wheat is coming up, being sourced out of the Black Sea. So uh, again, this is immediately disruptive to some of those countries as they now scramble for supplies. But again, I wanna uh, emphasize that this is a problem that is faced the world over in the sense that uh, we see, uh, again, prices for wheat increase uh, uh, significantly, prices for maize uh, increase significantly and, and even oil seeds. Next slide. So I, I want to uh, just kind of close with, with saying, you know, we're, we're talking about commodity prices. And I think that oftentimes when we see in the press that, oh, the commodity price index or what I just gave you, the, the numbers saying that, that the price of wheat is up 30, 40 percent. What's important is to know is how does that translate down to the consumer level? Because obviously if the farm value or the import value of, of, of a retail uh, uh, price of some product you're buying in the grocery store is actually pretty small, particularly in developed countries where there's a lot of additional processing. So just getting that bushel of wheat, harvesting it, milling it, milling it into flour and baking it into bread, by the time it gets to the retail grocery shelf, that, that value of wheat is pretty small in the overall package. But has important implications all the same. And bread prices and other things that we've already seen in countries like Egypt and, and across uh, North Africa already seen increases in prices, which means if, if for, for poorer populations in particular, they're paying a lot more unless the government is stepping up to sort of provide subsidies. So what we're, we're seeing again, 
even prior to this, this is what the inflation looked like around the world as of January. So prior to Ukraine, very high prices. Uh, I think you, you, you have to go back a long way. In the US, you have to go back to the early 1980s to see the sort of uh, food inflation that we've seen overall. Um, and, and in some countries, extremely high, I mean, driven by a number of factors, including macroeconomic factors, which aren't listed here, but, but other things like energy costs, labor costs, we saw all the supply disruption issues. Um, uh, and, and the great thing is we're gonna have speakers that are gonna address some of these issues um, over the next uh, um, a few minutes. I didn't have a chance to really go into much into input costs, but that's obviously a very big impact and could have a profound impact if uh, that is affecting uh, uh, input use and productivity over the next year. But I'm about at the end of my time and I'll turn it back to Leanne so uh, we can hear from some of the other speakers. Great, thank you very much, Joe and Seth for that, for setting the, setting the scene, reminding us of how, sort of how we got to the current situation and what was happening to prices even before the big events. Um, and also reminding us about how these prices can uh, affect consumers around the world um, in, in different ways. Um, before I turn over to our next speaker, I would just like to remind all of you who are tuning in live that you can submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfPre on Twitter, and we'll be coming around to the Q&A session um, at the end of the remarks from all our presenters. So with that, I would like to pass the floor now over to Allison Bentley. Allison is the director of the Global Wheat Program at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. Allison, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leanne, for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to join today. So I'll just wait for my slides to, to come up, uh, and then I'll get started. Uh, thank you. So, so as a scientist with expertise in, in plant breeding and genetics, my perspective today will be a little bit different uh, and we'll focus on potential solutions to some of the wheat price stability uh, and issues that we've just heard from Seth uh, and Joe. Uh, next slide, please. For the context, it's important to start with the essential role of wheat uh, in global food security. Uh, eaten by 2.5 billion people globally, uh, here we can visualize the importance of wheat's role in human diets uh, by looking at the ranking of daily dietary energy from food crops excluding sugar. Next slide, please. We see that the current crisis, which is occurring between two of the world's leading wheat exporters, having these immediate effects on wheat prices, as we've just heard, uh, which were already rising before the crisis. Given the scale of wheat consumption, which we also uh, recognize, this is likely to have short medium and long-term effects on the markets as well as on global food security. Uh, it's important to recognize that this isn't the first time we've been here uh, and therefore we have an opportunity to learn from past events. Uh, and part of this is clarifying the tangible actions that we can take uh, and today I'm going to briefly highlight some of these uh, potential uh, actions. So here we have a, have a list in terms of increasing productivity, expanding our wheat production, de-risking sources of short-term supply, uh, supporting a variety of paths to self-reliance uh, and balancing the narrative, the food system, uh, food and systems uh, diversity. Uh, across this, we also see an essential demand for new ways of working in terms of the funding models for agricultural development, the risk appetites and timeframes from our, our donors uh, and the mechanisms we employ to integrate across diverse disciplines, uh, particularly highlighting here strong cross-disciplinarity between biological and social sciences. Next slide, please. As many have reported and as we've just seen uh, from the previous presentation, part of the effect of the current crisis in terms of wheat stems from the strong reliance for exports uh, from a limited number of countries. Uh, in this map on the left, you can see uh, the current dominance of both Russia and Ukraine in terms of the global wheat export. Uh, and I also direct you to the link at the bottom of the page for a dynamic visualization of how this export landscape has changed over the past 60 or so years. Uh, we also know as wheat scientists and wheat breeders that over 6 million hectares of winter wheat uh, are growing in farmers' fields in Ukraine, uh, and the fate of this wheat in entering the global or even domestic market uh, is as yet unknown uh, and creates further uncertainty for the future. Next slide, please. If we, 
If we look at the uh, ne next one, please. If we look at the other side of the coin in terms of the imports uh, that we see across the world, we develop the picture of the likely short-term impacts as already highlighted in the previous presentation, with some countries likely to be hardest hit by the immediate restrictions to export. Uh, these maps here show the three-year average of imports by volume, uh, and we can see the particular Im impacts in Egypt, Turkey, Sudan, Yemen, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and parts of Southeast Asia, uh, and including regions where we know food security levels are at an all-time high. Next slide, please. So what have we learned from 2008 until today? Uh, it's clear that the issue attention cycles on global food systems are restarting with the potential to increase investment in international agriculture, uh, as is shown here from this previous graph on the left of CG funding peaks uh, linked directly to the last food crisis. But our key questions for 2022 in terms of applied solutions uh, are, can we create a more sustained value proposition for stability by investing in medium and long-term solutions to short-term uh, crises or, or situations in the global food system? Uh, can we minimize the time lag and the fragmentation uh, across the international agricultural development space? Uh, and can we build on existing capacity, really believing now is the time to, to embed stronger linkages with humanitarian organizations uh, and aims? Next slide, please. So looking beyond the ways of working, we're also pro proposing a, a wheat system agenda that's based around the comparative advantage of our current predominantly biophysical research and knowledge base. Uh, I'll briefly outline uh, some of the core aspects of this. Uh, first, as shown here, is increasing and expanding production, both to meet immediate demands and also to drive export potential. This includes three categories, our current areas, either expanding or optimizing production, along with the initiation of new areas of production. All of these uh, options and, and areas have various uh, underpinning and associated, associated considerations, uh, some of which are, are listed here. Next slide, please. Particularly in this second category of optimizing current production, we believe we have a good handle on the current production gaps. Uh, and that, that's visualized here in this map, which shows uh, the, the potential to increase uh, our productivity gaps for wheat specifically uh, around the world. So this is based on the theoretical maximum of productivity uh, from crop models uh, against the current levels of achieved productivity. Uh, in these scenarios, we also have a unique offer in the package of improved germplasm, seed systems, and agronomic in interventions that can be directly targeted to these specific identified regions to drive a productivity optimization. Next slide, please. Secondly, we look at many countries emphasizing the need to diversify the supply options, particularly in the short term. We can take here the oil and gas sectors as an analog, an example of the plasticity of supply, which also exists to some extent for the wheat markets. Uh, a number of governments have announced bilateral arrangements to purchase, for example, Russian wheat or to make supply available for exports, such as India. Uh, next uh, animation, please. Um, although this may help to stabilize the current supply situation, as a plant breeder, uh, I'm very aware of the inherent risks in terms of both the market as well as the biological fragility of our wheat production globally. For example, the quarantine pathogen dwarf bunts has previously restricted wheat imports by China from Russia due to the widespread pathogen damage potential uh, of this quarantine, uh, quarantine uh, pathogen. We therefore need strong safeguards in place to protect our future production uh, and to reduce the risks of new pandemics of plant diseases, which are catalyzed by the immediate need for grain. Next slide, please. We, we uh, and the next animation, sorry. <laughs> we also know that devastating pathogens move with the global seed trade. The story of wheat blast, which is one that's shown here at the DNA level, tells us that pandemic clones of plant pathogens can move rapidly between continents and across borders. Given we now have a, a DNA sequence level of resolution on our plant pathogens, we propose a scaling up of this capacity for surveillance. We're all very familiar with getting a negative COVID test before traveling, uh, and we propose a similar system for seed, uh, for the seed trade. And next slide, please. Thirdly, we also recognize the importance of support pathways to self-reliance, 
Uh, and there's a compelling offer here, both in the model and the package of technical interventions. Uh, and this includes the technical solutions, responsive input systems, as well as the, the open opportunity to, to reduce grain weights, the 15% gap that's incurred due to storage losses. Next slide, please. And, and finally, just to wrap up, we need a continuing conversation on the link between staple crop production and food security. As we move further away from, rather than closer to SDG 2 of zero hunger, uh, we need to ba balance the narrative of diversification of food supply. Uh, next animation, please. In terms of cereals in particular, we know that food security uh, is the food security response is increased production and low, of low cost staples. Uh, and there are incentives and priorities to achieving this. We also know that cereals, in particular wheat, uh, are, are in a volume term uh, important nutritional sources. Next slide, please. So just to wrap up uh, the key takeaways from my presentation uh, today, we'll continue to see increasing instability in global wheat. Uh, and we've, we at Simit are highlighting some of the applied approaches that can be taken to, to address the, the current situation, uh, as well as the future stability of our wheat system. So thank you very much for your attention uh, and happy to have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison, um, for that presentation, which I'm sure we'll come back to um, with lots of questions after we hear the rest of the presentations. And the reminder um, to be thinking also about the science that will help us find solutions and what kinds of investments the world needs to do to make sure that we have a way of, of having solutions when we're in these moments of crisis looking forward. Um, so the next speaker that I have on my list is John Baffis, who's the senior economist um, in macroeconomics, trade and investment at the World Bank Group. So I'll pass it over to John. John, you have the floor. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on your location. Thank you very much, Leanne, and thanks a lot to IFPI for uh, inviting me to share our views on commodity markets. Uh, today I'm going to speak mostly on energy markets, but before I do so, I will take a short detour to give you an idea of uh, our recent thinking on the global growth prospects. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we show here is uh, the global growth prospects for uh, both uh, advanced economies and uh, emerging market and developing economies. Uh, that was, of course, uh, was prepared prior to the Ukraine-Russian war. Uh, it was published in January uh, of this year. And uh, the point I would like to highlight here and uh, relates to the point made earlier by Joe is that uh, what uh, sort of surprised uh, us during this uh, COVID-19 downturn is the speed and the strength of the recovery that took place in the world economy. Uh, again, according to this uh, publication, uh, to the Global Economic Prospects, we expected that growth in uh, 2021 will be 5% uh, for advanced economies and a record 6.3% for uh, emerging markets and developing economies. And to a great extent, that explains why we, had, uh, we have seen such uh, a quick and sharp rebound in uh, most commodity prices. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we see here is again the three main commodity groups, energy, metals and agriculture for the past uh, decade or so. We see the dip uh, that took place uh, early in the early stages of the pandemic, which is especially uh, hard uh, for energy prices. Agricultural prices and metal prices do not decline as much, but uh, consistent with what we show, show uh, what I showed you earlier with the global economic uh, prospects of the global economy, we uh, saw uh, experienced a sharp rebound in global demand and that affected all commodity prices, especially energy and metals. And in terms of where we stand now in prices, uh, right now, probably in all commodity groups, uh, prices have reached, uh, at least in nominal terms, the levels that we've experienced back in the uh, in the spikes of uh, 2011 uh, and 2012. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me now get uh, a deeper look into energy markets. And here we're showing prices for daily prices for uh, two main uh, 
energy commodities, uh, Brent with a scale to the left and coal with a scale to the right. And we see that uh, both of those commodities or commodity prices had an upward trend uh, that began uh, even as early as December. And that, of course, was accelerated during the uh, following the outbreak of, uh, uh, of the Ukraine war. And uh, by now, both prices have reached levels that are comparable to 2011, or in the case of coal, uh, prices now are at a record high level. Uh, next slide, please. In this slide, we see the behavior of, uh, of Brent prices, uh, oil prices, that is. Here we look at the, the futures prices, which is a way of assessing what the markets look about the long-term evolution of, uh, uh, of oil prices. We have taken the, uh, the three current contracts, uh, futures contracts for Brent for the, next, uh, for the next three to four years. And we basically took three pictures, one uh, on uh, January 3rd, which was the first day of, the, of this year, the second of February 1, uh, which already incorporates some of the events that uh, were going to unfold in between Ukraine and Russia. And we have the contracts, the how contracts uh, evolved in March 1st, which pretty much fully incorporates the, the Russian-Ukraine uh, war. And uh, what we see is that uh, in between uh, January 3 and the March 1st, uh, brand prices in the uh, spot, the spot brand price, so to speak, or the first futures contract, they increase about uh, 25 or I would say $30. Of course, there has been quite a bit of volatility in the last few days, and that depends on which day you account, it was three days ago or two days ago. So it's about $30, the increase in between uh, early January and now. Now, when we look at uh, what is going to happen again, according to the futures markets, what's going to happen down the road, uh, at the end of 2025, uh, the increase is translated to about $10. So uh, the expectation according to the futures markets is that the long run, so to speak, price of oil is going to be about $10 higher than what it would have been in the absence, uh, in the absence of the uh, Ukraine war. Next uh, slide, please. Of course, those are short-term movements. They have a, we have experienced a lot of volatility, so I thought it would be uh, wise to look at the history of uh, energy commodity prices and uh, here i'm uh, looking at the prices of oil that from 1970 until now uh, now i have taken those prices and converted them into real terms and in the real terms uh, based on uh, January 2022 which means that uh, all the prices that you see here are in today's terms uh, the March, uh, during the first week of March, oil prices uh, averaged about $115 per barrel. And when we compare that to the history, the highest level that we've experienced was in June 2008. It was prior uh, during the, the spikes of 2007-2008. Uh, and in today's terms, uh, oil back then reached a high of uh, $171 per, per barrel. In, uh, nominal terms, it was around 35, I believe, but in real terms, it's 171, which means that today, again, the average of the first week of, uh, uh, of uh, February, prices are about, oil prices are about 35% uh, lower than what they had uh, reached uh, uh, in the spikes of 2008. So we have, uh, there's a huge uh, difference between then and now in oil. Now, uh, next slide, please. When we move to other markets, the, the picture is uh, quite different. Here we are also showing coal prices uh, for the same period, 1970 to now, the first week of, uh, uh, of February. And what we see now that coal has reached almost $400 per ton. And the highest that we had seen, again, in today's real terms, it was back, again, back in June of 2008, which was to uh, $132 per ton. So what we see here that in coal prices, at least prices today are twice as much as they used to be in the spike of 2008. Next slide, please. 
When we move to natural gas, uh, natural gas is a very complicated market because there's, uh, natural gas is traded both in LNG form as well as uh, through pipelines. And depending on which price you are looking at, you are uh, arriving kind of uh, different conclusions. Uh, if we take the index and the index of natural gas prices, which excludes the spot pricing uh, that takes place in LNG and in uh, Europe, uh, again, the index here is a bit higher. Uh, the index today is at uh, 330, which is uh, slightly higher than what it was uh, at its peak of uh, June 2008. Now, when we take into account uh, the spot pricing, especially the one that takes place now in Europe, we all know that prices of uh, spot prices in the uh, in Europe have uh, uh, are higher uh, perhaps by an order of magnitude compared to what uh, the prices that we had seen earlier in the last summer. And that's pretty much the case with uh, some LNG prices again in, uh, in spot terms. Uh, next slide, please. So the big question, of course, is uh, to forecast. Uh, that's what we are here just to get an assessment or to to build a framework of uh, uh, how commodity markets are, are, are going to evolve in the near future, in the longer term. Uh, forecasting right now is an extremely difficult and dangerous exercise. Uh, so instead, uh, what we do here is we took a, a longer, uh, sort of longer term view of the history and we try to identify which event in commodity markets uh, resembles best uh, historical events. There are at least uh, six events uh, in the history of commodity markets after the Second World War that involved the geopolitical uh, the military intervention. And those were Korean War, the 1972 oil price shock, 1979 uh, second oil price shock, the first Gulf War, September 11th attacks, and uh, the second Gulf War. So we have six events. It's not easy to find the similarities between the 1970. A crisis and today, but uh, in my opinion, the, perhaps the the greatest similarity is what unfolded in the or the second oil shock in 1979. And here I'm outlining the similarities. The first similarity is that in 1979, commodity markets were already under great stress, and that was because of the first uh, oil price spike, uh, subsequent geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, as well as market tensions between the oil companies and the oil producing nations. When we look at today, we can see it was clearly explained by the previous speakers that the markets are under great stress, commodity markets that is. We have COVID-19 uh, supply disruptions earlier in the COVID-19 phase. We had stronger, stronger than expected global growth, uh, which uh, had a positive, huge positive shock in commodity markets. And another reason is that we also have a kind of longer trend uh, taking place now, probably I would say as much as five years or more than that, and that's what uh, I would call uh, underinvestment in quotation marks in fossil fuels in response to uh, climate change. In terms of the second similarity, we have uh, both uh, shocks uh, were associated with conflict, Iranian revolution in Iraq, Iran-Iraq war in 1979, Russia-Ukraine war now. Uh, there's a third similarity, but uh, that back then we had a demand-driven transition from oil to coal and other types of energy sources, which include natural gas, renewable sources, and nuclear power generation. We have another transition going on today, which is the climate uh, change-driven transition from uh, fossil fuel oils to renewable energy sources. Lastly, uh, there's another sort of, I wouldn't call it similarity, I would call it difference, and that's in, very important for the current debate, that the energy crisis in 1979 was led mostly by oil. The energy crisis uh, today is led by coal and natural gas. That's very important for, uh, for the context of our discussion because uh, coal and natural gas is a key input to electricity. Uh, is also a key input to fertilizers, and both electricity and fertilizers co combined collectively play a large role as input sources in uh, production of food and agriculture in general. So, what were the consequences of the 1979 uh, uh, crisis? 
Uh, I call them Economics 101, borrowing the North uh, American tradition in the university system, which um, uh, and by that I imply those are kind of predictable and expected by basic economic principles, the consequence, I mean, the outcome of the 1979 crisis. Uh, and that is that uh, uh, we had the energy saving policies back then. Uh, we also have a lot of announcements in energy saving policies now. Uh, we had uh, what uh, analysts and economists call this uh, demand destruction, where prices exceed a certain level, then demand falls uh, quite a lot. Uh, we have uh, back then we had the new sources of uh, oil, Alaska, Gulf of Mexico, and the North Sea, simply a, a, res a response to the, the high oil prices. And we also had substitution of oil by other energy sources. So those are the four sort of reactions that took place after the spike and the subsequent decline in prices of uh, uh, in the shock of 1979. Let me also mention that back in 1979, prices were increasing sharply for about 12 months, but the decline took much longer. It took about uh, six to seven years. And uh, the lower point of the decline, which, low, which was much lower than uh, the increase. Now, a second outcome or consequence of the 1979 uh, 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 shock or shock was the, the creation of price, price benchmarks uh, for most energy commodities, especially for uh, natural gas in North America and uh, for uh, crude oil, which established the WTI, the Brent uh, benchmarks, respectively for North America oil pricing as well as the world oil pricing. Uh, and the lastly, high energy prices back then led to inflationary pressures. Uh, for just to give you an example, the US CPI averaged nearly 12% during the three year period 1979 82. So, uh, my last cell in this uh, table is three question marks, uh, but I would uh, argue that uh, what we're going to see in the near future is going to be a repeat of the consequence that we saw back in 1979. The key question is uh, how long those events or consequences rather it's going to take to to unfold and uh, how severe they're going to be uh, i would say probably the the duration of those sort of consequences is going to be uh, much smaller than it was uh, uh, that took uh, that it was the case back in 1971 uh, for example, uh, we can see that oil prices reached the peak of 130 recently, I mean recently, a few days ago. Now there's a slight uh, sort of smaller reduction in oil prices and uh, probably the wars in oil, I don't know, I wouldn't argue that the wars is over, but we have seen uh, the kind of reactions, uh, including the, the ban of exports or other imports by the United States and uh, uh, the European Union. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties what's going to happen in uh, 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 what's going to happen in the coal market and especially the natural gas market. I don't think we've seen uh, all events and all, all consequences unfold, unfolding in those two markets. And uh, but the most important point that I would highlight uh, in this, so to speak, crisis is that, again, going back to the point I made earlier, that the 1970 crisis, the 1979 crisis involved oil for the most part. Today, crisis involved natural gas and coal in addition to oil, but it also involved agricultural commodities, especially grains. The speakers very clearly indicated earlier, showed us earlier how important this region is, the Central Asia region is to the grain markets. And it also involves fertilizer markets. And that's important for two reasons. First, because the region is very important fertilizer producer. And of course, for the big reason, the important reason that both coal and natural gas are inputs into the fertilizer market. So with those three question marks, I would end my presentation. And uh, again, thanks uh, to Yves very much for inviting me the present to give this presentation. And I'll be very happy to respond to questions and concerns. Great. Thank you so much, John, for those remarks about the energy markets, um, which also remind us how important energy is in terms of agricultural commodity markets and the implications that what's going on in energy is going to spill over into commodity markets. And also for highlighting um, the similarities and differences between previous situations in 1979, where we had an um, energy crisis and um, compared to what's going on now. And one of the things that really 
stuck out to me also was the slide, the line that you said, um, now we're also dealing with climate change and potential change in demand for different types of um, sources of energy. So that to me seems like another interesting area of potential uncertainty in this moment. Um, so with that, um, actually, this is a nice segue. We're switching now to transportation markets. So um, for this presentation, we have Arno Petit, who's the executive director of the International Grains Council. Um, and Arno is here, and I'll pass the floor directly to you. Uh, good, uh, good day to everyone, and, and thank you very much for granting the opportunity to IGC to be part of this uh, very interesting uh, seminar. Um, and I would say, next slide please, that IGC sharing information is also part of our DNA, so I really uh, uh, very uh, looking for one this exchange of information. Just here this slide to remind that when we look about grains at IGC, we will look always about both sides as a market, but also as we are implementing the Food Assistance Convention, it is also about food security uh, for uh, needy countries. So definitely, uh, it's the topics you are addressing today is something also we, we are always confronting on a, on a daily basis. And if we, uh, we, we focus on freight here, I would like to, to say that we have two challenges, one which has uh, really well introduced by uh, Joseph and Seth about supply, what about supply, but also now logistics. And the freight market is really good indicators to look about how the market may adapt to this new situation. Uh, next slide, please. If we, we look first about um, the, the Baltic Dry Index, which is uh, the main index on the uh, vessel higher prices, indeed, you, you see that with the Baltic Dry Index reach uh, 13 years high in October 2021. And these values uh, have dropped uh, since by uh, to to have down by 62 percent from october and the losses in grains oil seeds and the of carrying sectors by one third the reasons of the drop are mainly the worries about the chinese demand and mind the sign of an economic slowdown and a coal export ban in indonesia in early 2022 if and now what we have did for igc we set up a specific index of threat dedicated to grain. So indeed, here we are only monitoring the hiring price of vessels dedicated to grains. We uh, also built up a monitoring of the cost of loading, the cost of fuel, and rebuilt all the routes, so for 430 routes. And here you have here uh, the composition of this index, GOFI, uh, uh, as we call it. And indeed, you can see also we have seen the same peak in terms of GoFi till October, but maybe uh, we have seen a drop, uh, a lower drop than the, the Baltic Dry Index by only 28%. Uh, and despite the drop, the freight cost is still 19% is still higher year to year. So that's something also to bear in mind. So the, what means the logistic and the freight in the grain sector is still under tension. Uh, next slide, please. please. Uh, this tension is um, different between the routes. And you can see in the first table about the variation in routes, um, Argent uh, Australia, Argentina, uh, and uh, Brazil are the routes currently which are still under pressure. So we increase in difference year to year. Um, so Australia 37%, uh, Argentina um, 18%, and Brazil 24%. And if we try to look about the component here, sorry for my internet connection. Um, so if I just come back, so the matter is about um, the cost of fuel. So you, you have seen that the cost of hiring a vessel as a slowdown and a bit recovered by 9% in the, in the last month. But indeed, the real change has been the cost of, um, of, of fuel. Sorry, I tried to uh, have a better. So now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of um, now the alternative route. So we try to see if, if uh, now with the Black Sea region, uh, the, all the trade has been totally stopped. Uh, in Ukraine for the obvious reasons that uh, all the ports are under uh, under attacks. And indeed, uh, also in Russia, we have seen any movement. 
because uh, owners of shipments are not keen to send the cargoes in, in as of sea. Uh, the price of, um, of insurance has been also now very prohibitive. So indeed, what we can see, what, what we can expect in terms of uh, alternative routes, uh, first of all, is uh, EU. Uh, and you can see, for example, on this chart that an EU, we have seen a, a slow recovery, I would say, in, in terms of price of freight in EU. The major part of the vessels which were dedicated to go to a Black Sea region, now we have seen are back. Uh, to, e, to or to EU or to the Mediterranean area to try to respond to potential increase of demand. Uh, and then the second uh, area where, which is in, in full progress uh, in terms of uh, export program is Australia. And definitively we have seen uh, now um, an increased demand in Australia, uh, large volume of this, um, sorry, by contrast, Australia to ramp up the shipment in the near term due to extremely tight loading capacity which means there is still an opportunity in terms of volume to export from Australia, but the export program and the capacity at port to export more will be a challenge. Then, which means in terms of next alternative possible is about um, uh, in India. And India is, um, here you have in the, in the graphics, sorry, uh, the potential uh, competitiveness of India in relation to, uh, to export. And definitively, India have still some stocks on wheat. Um, so the question mark will be, is India would be able to, uh, in, in terms of logistics, to transport the, its wheat from the inland side to the port and to start to export more wheat in order to uh, limit the, the pressure on the, on the grains market. And the next slide, please. Um, Yes, so in the next slide, so if uh, we, we take into account and what we are seeing in terms of uh, cost of fuel and the, and the crude oil market. What we you see here is definitively the routes, the longer routes uh, would be mainly impacted. And when we are talking about the longer routes is from South America uh, to China, for example, where the, the, the share of, of oil or cost of fuel is the most important. And to give you a, more or less uh, an impact is for every $10 barrel more on the crude oil market, Indeed, you have an over cost of $3 a ton uh, for transportation of grains. So which means from the beginning of the crisis, the, we could assess that as we have seen the, the, the market, the dollar, so the crude oil markets were increased increase by $40, $50 a barrel, which you can translate indeed by uh, nine to uh, 12 more or less dollar more just to transport the same cargo to the same destinations. So that's something we will need to look in a, in, a, in a medium term. So for the next marketing year, if this increase the transport, cost of transportation may redesign uh, the, the logistics, uh, partic partic particularly in Asia, because the, what is clear is the Black Sea region was the most competitive area of production. So what now we need to look is how the developing countries will be able to redirect some of the origination from Black Sea area from other regions. And that's something we, we, we need still to look and I hope the, the tool we have set up uh, here about the threat monitoring will help to anticipate some movement. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arnaud. That was a great um, segue from the previous uh, presentation on energy costs. And I think it raises a lot of interesting questions about the value of investing in transparency so that we have information when we need it, when something happens. Um, and also it, it raised some questions for me about um, how, how uh, changing transportation routes, what that implies for investment in different kinds of facilities um, and types of transportation. So maybe we can also come back to that when we get into the Q&A later on. Um, so just if you're just joining us, I'd like to remind you that um, at the end of our presentations, you'll have the opportunity to, to submit questions. And you can submit these in several ways. You can submit to ifpre.org, to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to YouTube, or by using the hashtag, hashtag askifpre on Twitter. And we'll be coming to these um, during the Q&A sessions, which is after the next few presentations.
so with that, our next presentation is going to move us into the world of input markets, um, specifically fertilizers. And I'd like to turn the floor over to Charlotte Heberbrand, who's the Director of Communications and Public Affairs at IFPRI. Uh, Charlotte, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leanne, and uh, thanks for all the preceding speakers for setting the scene very nicely for what's happening in, in fertilizers. Um, just to say that I'm uh, sort of wearing an old hat here. I spent eight years with the International Fertilizer Association, and I thank them for some of the data, as well as the World Bank for the, the price data that I'll be showing. Um, so I'll be um, showing you some of the price trends. Um, if you can pull up the, yeah, the title page, that's great. I'll, I'll briefly go through some of the price trends, and then I'd like to address some sort of unique characteristics of the fertilizer value chain with a view to explaining why the, the, the fertilizer sector might be particularly vulnerable to disruptions. Um, then we'll look at some drivers of fertilizer supply and demand, all of which kicked in a lot already in 2021 to increase prices. And then I'm going to end with just some thoughts about what might lie ahead. Uh, next slide, please. So here, uh, this is data from the World Bank, and I think we've made that point already uh, numerous times. You can see that really fertilizers, agricultural commodity prices, energy prices are pretty closely interwoven, uh, joined at the hip, uh, one might say. And uh, the, the green line here is the composite, right? So it's nitrogen, um, phosphate, and potash fertilizers. And you can see that the highs of 2011 and 2012 were actually followed by a rather long-term uh, decline of prices uh, through a part of 2020. And then you can see a, a sharp increase uh, that, that took place for most of 2021. Um, and, and just in the very last bit there, and, and you can see here the, the COVID era is actually goes up until, it says September 21 on the bottom, but it's actually up to today. And, and there was a slight decrease in prices just uh, uh, in the beginning of the year. February still showed us a slight decrease, but that is uh, not likely to, to remain the trend. Next slide, please. Here you uh, see the same uh, similar graph, uh, but we're looking here in particular at, um, at uh, phosphate fertilizers. Again, very similar scenario, uh, a dr dramatic increase um, uh, through, through um, starting in 2020 and going up to uh, obviously today. Uh, last, uh, next slide is um, presenting the same picture for potash, but you'll notice that it actually is, is rather different here. So, so the gray line um, shows the uh, contract prices for, for potash. Potash is still sold uh, a great majority of it on, under contract prices, in particular, very large contracts, annual contracts with China and India. So that has helped to keep the, 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 the prices down. Um, and then the red line, and sorry, it's not on the legend, shows the spot prices. So here you do see similar to the other um, graphs I just showed a, a very significant uptick um, starting in 2020 and going through uh, really uh, uh, most of 2021. And again, a slight, downturn um, recently, but again, we don't expect that to, to remain in place. Um, next slide, please. So let's look at some of the sort of uh, supply chain characteristics of the fertilizer sector, which, which make it perhaps particularly um, vulnerable to to, to some disruptions. Um, so you can see here, your first pie chart uh, shows ammonia, the second one phosphoric acid, and the, the third one MOP. So these are sort of the base building blocks of, um, of fertilizers. And you can see for ammonia um, that just between China and Russia, we have 40, almost half of global production um, in those two countries. Now, this, these, these, this slide shows production. If you were going to look at trade, 
um, sorry, uh, it's 50% of global pr production between China, Russia, and the US. So three countries make up 50% of global production in ammonia. Now, if we were going to look at just the, the traded nitrogen, um, here Russia is actually the largest exporter. It has a share of 16.5% of, of global trade, followed by China and Saudi Arabia. In the middle, you have phosphoric acid. Again, noticeable here that China and Morocco, two countries, make up more than 50% of production. Um, these are uh, 2020 figures. And Russia comes in at 8% of production of phosphoric acid. Again, if we were to look at uh, traded volumes only, um, China has about 25% of global trade, Morocco 17.4, and Russia 12.7. And then last, um, let's look at potash. So here you can see four countries, Canada, Russia, Belarus, and China, which make up pretty much 80% of the world's potash production in 2020. So um, even more significant uh, supply chain characteristics here. If we were to look at just traded um, potash, the numbers are uh, Canada would be responsible for 36% uh, of global trade of potash, Belarus for 18.5%, so very significant, and Russia 16.5% of, of global trade in, in potash. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing to keep in mind about the supply chain characteristics, and it really follows from the, from the previous slide, is that a very significant um, part of fertilizer of global fertilizer consumption is derived from imports. So if you look at, um, I think the numbers here have been switched around. I just uh, noticed that. So uh, uh, nitrogen is 29% of global consumption is traded. Um, and if you look at phosphate, it's 48%. So almost 50% of, of all phosphate consumed by farmers around the world is coming from imports. And then the largest figure here is for potash. Please replace uh, the K figure with the N figure. Some 82% of all um, potash consumed around the world is derived from imports. So very, very significant. And this means of course that many, many countries are highly dependent on imports, in particular uh, for phosphate and, and, and potash. Next slide, please. So what are some of the drivers of fertilizer supply? Um, we've already touched on a number of these, um, production and transportation costs and other kinds of disruptions. Very important to keep in mind that energy feedstocks are, are, uh, are make up about 70 to 80% of ammonia production costs. Most of the world's ammonia is produced with natural gas, with an important exception of China, which still largely relies on, on coal to produce its ammonia. But of course, both natural gas prices, as well, uh, John showed coal prices are at their highest ever, um, have hit uh, uh, in, throughout 2021 already and are continuing to, to see increases as a result of the, the recent developments. So those have a huge impact on um, production of ammonia. Uh, energy price is also very important for phosphate fertilizers because in order to make um, phosphate fertilizers, you need ammonia um, and you also need sulfur and sulfur prices also have been um, uh, at their peaks uh, uh, in, in the past year or so. So we've seen already in 2021 ammonia production cuts in Europe and China. Um, just today, uh, Yara, the second largest um, ammonia and urea producer, um, has announced that they are now uh, cutting their production of ammonia and urea in Europe by 55%. So uh, as a result, of course, of the announcements also of yesterday, that um, uh, Europe is, is looking to phase out uh, uh, using natural gas from Russia. Um, they are, their plan is to phase it out by two thirds already um, by the end of this year, and then to completely phase it out by 2030. And of course, the US has also uh, announced uh, um, just yesterday its import ban on Russian oil. It hits Europe, of course, much harder since there is a much greater reliance there. <clears throat> 
on, on Russian energy. Um, also in, in 2021, you did see some, some weather related problems that also led to temporary outages on the production side. Now, trade measures also have a huge impact on, on fertilizer supply. And throughout 2021, there were a number of measures, whether those were trade remedies that were imposed, export freezes by countries that are worried about, uh, they, they want to keep fertilizers for their own farmers. Um, um, and then you also had export quotas and, uh, in a number of countries and a complete um, halt of exports. And then, of course, Sanctions on Belarus were already applied last year, but just now in March, um, there has been further expansion of those sanctions, which now very much hit the potash uh, sector as well. Next slide, please. Uh, on the fertilizer demand side, of course, uh, higher crop prices tend to drive up prices of fertilizers. Um, important to think about the fertilizer crop price ratio. Farmers and countries that are also benefiting from higher crop prices can perhaps weather higher input prices, but that is, of course, not true for all farmers around the world. Um, weather in producing countries plays a huge impact on demand. And then fertilizer subsidies is another huge demand driver. Uh, we estimate that about 50% of fertilizer demand is actually driven by fertilizer subsidies. So that is a huge component. Um, so I just wanted to briefly show here the changes in fertilizer demand. Um, and these uh, figures come from the International Fertilizer Association. You can see that there was a huge uptick in fertilizer demand um, in 2020, 2020. These are fertilizer years of 6.3%. So similar to some of the other presentations, this was really the roar back of demand uh, uh, after the, the, the first year of COVID. Um, next slide, please. And what these are just sort of questions there. I don't think we have good answers yet, but these are things to think about as we watch the fertilizer sector um, moving ahead. So what's in store for the weather and harvests in particular, of course, in Ukraine, um, what will happen to the harvest? What will happen? Will they be able to get the harvest out? Um, energy prices, certainly it looks like we're in for more increases. Um, agricultural commodity prices, uh, I imagine will also be in for further increases. Uh, that will translate into more production um, costs for the fertilizer industry, but there is going to be some new production capacity coming on stream. India is really trying to ramp up its own ammonia and, and urea production. There is um, capacity coming on stream in Nigeria and Brunei. Big question, of course, about sanctions as well as export restrictions. And government subsidies. India last year increased its fertilizer um, subsidy budget by 140%. Um, can all countries do that? Um, uh, that's a big, big question mark. So will all of this, all these high prices lead to potential demand destruction? And then in green, I've put some, some maybe longer term questions, but there are serious dangers uh, already fertilizers are not applied really in a balanced fashion. So when prices go up this high, farmers tend to really skimp on potash and phosphate, which has implications for soil health. Um, fertilizer use efficiency is not great already. Um, so perhaps one positive aspect of this crisis might be that farmers really start to think about um, applying fertilizers in a more efficient way so that less nutrients are wasted um, or lost to the environment and more of them are taken up by by crops and then the, the 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 energy prices perhaps they could trigger a move towards more so-called green fertilizers there's a lot of excitement about things like green ammonia which is produced from uh from electrolysis which which can be powered by uh, renewable energy. Um, so perhaps that could be an impetus, a further impetus for those kinds of um, fertilizers and, and increased efficiency. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, and also for bringing out some of these questions about policies and government intervention around trade restrictions and sanctions and how those those can have a big impact on markets, obviously. And I also appreciated your comment about subsidies, because, of course, we know all these policies are also affecting the way markets can adjust in these moments where there are big changes happening.
And finally, um, I appreciated that you ended with this forward looking question, including the question of what, about what the results are for soils, because of course, um, maybe not in the short term right now, but we will, we need to be thinking about those kinds of long term investments as well um, as we think about resilient and sustainable um, ag commodity markets. So with that, um, I now um, am going to turn to a presentation that's focusing on crop conditions. And for that, we have Inbal Becker Reshef with us. She's the director of the NASA Harvest and Research Professor at the University of Maryland. I didn't get that quite right, sorry, Inbal. Um, but I'm really looking forward to, to your presentation. I know you have a lot of great granular information that you're going to share with us. So um, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much for, for that introduction. Um, I am the director of NASA Harvest, which is NASA's food security and agriculture program, um, but also wear another hat, which I'll talk a little bit more about as well, um, within the G20 GeoGlam Secretariat. So um, just very brief context, um, both of those programs, sorry, next, yeah. Um, both of those programs, both NASA Harvest and, and GeoGlam are very much focused on the use of satellite earth observations. Um, for enabling us to better monitor globally food supplies and, and uh, crop production. Um, the NASA Harvest Program is um, within the Applied Sciences Program, whereas the GeoGlam Program really provides the international G20 framework. Again, very much focused, both of them very much focused on increasing market transparency um, and improving food security by providing relevant, timely, global and transparent information on global food prospects. Um, next. So I think, as we've already heard, um, it is very clear that we need to be able to and to have capacity to monitor um, crop production and the agricultural lands across the world in a timely way. Um, and that can be more true than than it is today. I think if you look at the origins, in fact, of satellite um, observations and, and monitoring in particular for agriculture that goes all the way back to the early days of satellite monitoring. And in fact, on the USDA side for starting up their uh, satellite program with the Lacey program was the a shortfall and a drought in the former Soviet Union. So um, here we are now still very much focused on being able to monitor that part of the world, which is um, such an important uh, part of the world for uh, food production. Um, I think We've heard uh, quite a lot already where we are facing a food crisis and it's not so much a question of if, but rather how severe and what the implications of the, the, the invasion and, and, the, and what's following that uh, will have on, on, um, on, on food. Um, I think, uh, and as we've already heard, we have very much a global and interconnected food system. So um, it's not enough for us to be monitoring what's happening in Ukraine or what's happening in Russia or, or what's happening in the US, but really whatever happens in, in particular in some of these major production export countries has massive implications uh, globally, both for the, the more food insecure, the importing countries, as well as for, for exports. And so it's really important for us to have the capability to monitor at a global scale and in a timely manner um, the agricultural lands and, and crop lands and, and to be able to forecast crop uh, prospects. And so therefore satellite data um, can play and are playing a major role in, in providing this kind of information and particularly so in parts of the world where we cannot get ground information. Um, and so I think on, from our side, from the satellite uh, community perspective, I would say we've, ha we've seen a, a huge uptick in terms of requests that we're getting for utilization of, of satellite data in support of various um, questions, whether that's around extreme weather events that are occurring and what kind of impact those are gonna have. We had a lot of requests in the context of COVID, um, in the context of, of various conflicts and, and whether that's impacting, for example, planted areas. And of course, now very much so in the context of the invasion in, in, in Ukraine. And so we are actually thinking about and, and, and moving forward to launching a coordinated initiative in, in response to being able to be even more responsive to, to these kinds of demands. Um, but we are doing, of course, a lot of operational monitoring at the global scale. And, and so that's really what I wanna talk about uh, today. Uh, next. Um, and so some of the areas that we're very much focused on at the moment is, of course, to be able to monitor crop conditions as well as yield forecasts in Ukraine and in Russia, um, both for the ongoing wheat season, 
um, as well as it will be really critical to be able to monitor planted area for the spring crop. So um, spring planting is just around the corner, starts in, in, in April. And so being able to look at you know, how much of the corn is going to be able to be planted, can we look at signals of uh, field preparation and then, of course, of, of emergence of crops? And that's going to be um, very important for us to, to be able to, to monitor, in, in particular in, in Ukraine. Um, as we've heard already um, from, from the various speakers, um, in terms of the gap that might be in, in, in uh, being able to fill from the exports that come out of Russia and Ukraine, um, if the grain cannot come out of uh, Ukraine and, uh, and, and of course from, from Russia as well. And so are there, who can fill that gap? What, what being able to monitor those major um, producing areas of, of the world and being able to track, for example, the US, for example, uh, South America, Europe, et cetera, will be really critical. Um, we're also focusing on monitoring crop conditions and, and developments in importing countries and in those countries that depend on exports coming out of the Black Sea region. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, I'll give examples of what's going on at the moment. And then of course, also being able to monitor major consuming countries. And I think we, um, there was a news article that I saw a couple of days ago from China saying that they might be having their worst winter wheat um, season. So of course that becomes very important as well. Um, and then remembering uh, that any disruption that we have due to weather, and we have been seeing more increased severe weather that has can have major implications for crop production. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we are now in a second consecutive La Nina, and that has and can have some implications for, for major producing parts of, of the world. And then as we heard, of course, is what the impact is gonna be um, of higher fertilizer costs on yields and, and productivity. Next. And so I'll go through where we are in terms of current crop conditions. And, and these are produced as part of the crop monitor. That's an initiative under GeoGlam um, with inputs from over 40 different organizations that contribute into this. These are operational assessments that um, have been going on since 2013 um, and focused on some of the main commodity crops. Uh, next. And so these are just to give a, a sense, these are the, the parts of the world that we are covering. We have different initiatives, one focused more on the big production export countries under the uh, AMIS framework, um, and another crop monitor, both of these are published every month, um, focused more on the, the food insecure countries called the crop monitor for early warning. Next. And so combining the inputs from, from both of those crop monitors, this is a global view of, of crop conditions. And I should just mention, we are working on putting out also a, a global monitor and, and uh, I've been in a dialogue also with the International Grain Councils on this. Um, but this is looking at uh, current conditions as of the end of uh, February. Any, just to, um, anywhere that we have a yellow means that these are conditions that there are some areas of, of, uh, of concern. Um, and then we'll put a, um, a little icon of which crop is being impacted. Um, uh, red and kind of the, the dark red are poor or failure. Anywhere that's favorable um, is green. You're looking only at anywhere that there is color is only the, the, the agricultural regions of the world. Um, where you have the dark gray, those are agricultural regions that are currently not in season. Um, and so very quickly, and, and I'll go through the different commodity crops very quickly, you do get a, a quick overview of where we stand at the moment. Obviously, um, various areas of the world that are currently of concern, in particular, both from major producing parts of the world, but also in some of the countries that are already most vulnerable to food insecurity. Next. So if we look at specifically at, at wheat conditions in the northern hemisphere, um, it's, it's uh, the crop was mostly planted in the fall. It's coming in, in some parts already out of um, the, the winter months of, of vernalization. Um, and so it's still in, in early within the season, but um, if you look, there are areas of concern in the US and the main wheat growing regions. Again, it's early in the season. Some areas of concern around Europe. Um, of course, we, we have highlighted Ukraine as an area of concern in large part due to the conflict. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about um, conditions in Ukraine. 
Here we have a um, pie chart that shows global production of wheat and each um, slice of the pie chart is a proportion of that country's contribution to um, production of, of wheat. And then you can see how much of, of production of that particular, in this case of the EU, for example, is being currently under a, a watch condition. And so you can very quickly get a, a quick sense of what uh, crop uh, conditions are. Um, I think around 80% at the moment is under favorable conditions, but around 20% is under a watch or, or poor conditions. Next. And so if we look particularly at Ukraine, um, one thing that satellite data afford us to do is to be able to actually map, map where all the wheat specifically is growing. Next. And so this is looking again at, at percentages uh, based on last year of where the major wheat producing areas in the, in, are within Ukraine. And of course, the southern area um, is a really critical part of, of the and, and central areas of, of wheat production in Ukraine. Next. Um, and so here is looking at some uh, vegetation index called NDVI an anomalies over Ukraine. There have been some dry conditions. And so anywhere that you're seeing kind of red or dark is there's less vegetation um, than average. Although I should say it is very early still in the season and what's really gonna determine um, production is gonna be uh, what follows around in, in particular in April and in, in May. So um, we've often seen drier conditions at this time of the year and crops can, can recover very significantly. Um, next. And so here are some of the different indicators that we can look at. This is looking at the Southern part of Ukraine. Um, and if you look at this top chart here, this is last year, this um, purple line uh, on uh, at the top. Um, and last year was a record production. And so you can see both that peak once the, the crop is planted and in the ground. And then you see the big peak in, in June um, of around flowering of, um, of winter wheat. And then if you see the, the blue line is this current season's development. Um, so it is below still last year, but again, that was in the very early parts of the growing season, still very early to see. We do see if you look uh, over at the next graph, the cumulative precipitation is, is below the five-year average, but again, still time for that to recover. Um, if you look at the bottom middle, the temperature graph, um, this winter was warmer than average, although now cooler temperatures are coming in. Um, next. And so all these kinds of charts we are we have made publicly available on a on, on a um, an interface that you can go and, and get to. And then in the last um, week or so, we've also developed a new dashboard that has quite a lot of different indicators and inputs, including from IFPRI um, and IGC on on different um, both on on trade and on crop conditions, also overlaying where the conflicts are with where uh, different parts of of uh, the major growing regions are in the world, and then. Um, different price indices, et cetera. So I invite you all to, to go and look at that as well. Next. Um, looking at other major growing regions uh, for wheat in particular, again, recalling that Ukraine and Russia combined account for 30% or so of global exports. Um, there are concerns over the U.S., in particular over the, the um, major wheat growing part of uh, within the U.S., but again, early in the season, but you can see that impact of the drought. Um, the red dot but on the middle panel of cumulative precipitation also integrates the forecast, so we can still see that there's not much rain forecast in the next two weeks in that part. Similarly, in France, um, some concern over dry conditions. Next. And then again, coming back to this question on uh, China and this, uh, um, uh, I guess this article that came out anyways about um, information from the ministry saying that this could be one of the worst uh, uh, seasons in, in history. I think if we look at the data, we can see that there was less establishment in, um, of the when in, in the fall when it was planted, but of course, still a lot of time for that crop to um, have a good outcome. And, and the, again, the, the coming months will be really critical for wheat production in China. Next. Um, if we look at some of the major importing regions, as, um, as uh, Joe was pointing out, um, we're looking at Northern Africa, we're already seeing droughts and um, poor conditions in, uh, in, in Morocco and then in, in watch in, in, in Tunisia. And if we look at the, the three month forecast that's still forecast out to, to have dry conditions, so again, quite concerned there, in particular in regions that are importing, um, also across in, in the Middle East, so in North Africa and the Middle East. 
Um, next, and again, showing those same charts, and you can just see how much below average the, the current season is. Um, switching over into maize conditions, uh, concern over, as, as Seth had, had pointed out, um, conditions in, in, South, in South America, and in, in particular in, in Brazil and in uh, Argentina. Um, and again, uh, you can see that pie chart there and showing what percentage of the production of both of those countries is either under poor or under watch conditions, and that's largely due to, to dryness. Um, but we're also having dry conditions in, in Eastern Africa. Um, the short rainy season has just ended, in particular in Kenya, has ended with poor conditions. And they're looking now at uh, prospects of a fourth consecutive dry season in large part um, coming up for the March, April, May season that will, um, will just be starting. Um, and then also some concerns due to, to dryness in, in Southern Africa. Um, next. And so here's again, looking at some of these charts in particular of Southern Brazil that we heard about earlier. And, and again, this is looking at these NDVI anomalies in Southern Brazil and in, in, in Northern Argentina. And again, looking at tracking that season through different indicators, whether that's vegetation indices, precipitation, um, temperature, and being able to compare this current season to uh, previous seasons. And I should say that while I'm showing here very much um, uh, um, crop conditions, we do take all these data and provide and, and compute quantitative actual forecasts of crop yields as well. Um, next. And so finally, soybeans, and, and here the main story is, is again, South America and, and prolonged uh, drought impacting in particular both Southern Brazil and Argentina. And again, here in the pie charts, you can see what proportion of, of global production is currently under a watch or, or poor conditions. So all of these will be, of course, very important to continue to track as the seasons um, progress. And then as we get into the Northern hemisphere, some spring and summer growing seasons. Next. And so if we look at, um, we're currently in a second La Nina um, phase. And so here, what I'm showing, and, and this is coming out of the um, UCSB Climate Hazard Center, is looking at areas that are that under La Nina typically will be drier than, than usual uh, versus areas that are wetter than usual. And as you can see, a lot of those areas that are drier than usual also correspond with major production um, and exporting regions of the world. So we will be watching this season um, an upcoming season very, very carefully, um, especially given what we've already heard about the, the prices and, and tighter markets. And next, I think this is my last slide. Um, and so also looking both at the two week precipitation forecast, we can see a lot of the dry conditions continuing on in, in the US and in Europe and, and actually in, in Ukraine. Um, and then looking at the three month seasonal precipitation outlook um, in large parts of the world, also very much driven by this um, current La Nina. And with that, with that I'll, I'll stop and just say it, um, it satellite data really are a, an, an incredibly important tool to be able to provide us this information at a global scale across all the agricultural um, parts of, of the world and uh, enable us to be able to track, especially also where we don't have information on the ground. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Inval. And I know um, GeoGlam plays such an important role in the AMIS process too. So um, all these investments in transparency and monitoring really, I think, can make a difference in terms of making sure people have the information they need when they need it. Um, I know that Arnaud is going to have to drop off the call a little bit sooner than the end. So we have a, a little more than half an hour for Q&A. And so I wanted to first ask Arnaud a question. I've seen some questions come in um, from our listeners, but um, I wanted to circle back to this question about investment, Arno, um, and how you were talking about the, the changing routes um, for transportation, and um, we were thinking a lot during COVID about what was going on with logistics and how that might also be affecting um, the way transportation was working, and I wondered if you could just uh, give us a little comments on how these changes affect the way investors think about the changes that need to happen and how that needs to go forward. Yes, I think we have a good example in, in the Middle East. If you look in Dubai you now, the Dubai port has invested a lot in a franchise zone, uh, where processing facilities now are developing there. And they try to, uh, I would say, to attract some volumes from India to process and then to get back to uh, South Asia or to China even. And that's maybe, a, 
a part when we all always expected when India could grow up in the global market, and that may be a, an, opportun an opportunity, if I may say so, uh, for, for India to, to grow and to really take its, its place in the global market, uh, relating to, to soybean or on, on wheat. And maybe more maybe in the short term, what we could see for developing country, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is also the potential balance or uh, to shift, I would say, uh, the diet between wheat and rice, because we have seen the rice market a bit stable, despite uh, the situation on, on wheat and maize, and the consumption of rice is growing in, in that region. So um, there is uh, an opportunity if the price of wheat starts really to be at, at the such level, you, you destroy the demand, I, I would say in an economic ter economical term, uh, that indeed there, there may be a shift uh, to, to the rice. So that's logistic on rice is not like a logistic on wheat. You don't uh, you don't do it on a bulk uh, cargo. So that's also also something to, to look at in the future. Great, thank you very much for that. That was very clear. Um, I have a very big question that came in um, through our online sources, and I and I think what I'll first do is bounce it to Seth and Joe. So that, so this question is um, basically related to whether or not the world has learned from previous crises. Um, are we better prepared in this moment, um, especially around agricultural and food commodity markets um, to be able to handle something that could be quite, uh, quite disruptive like this? So I'm not sure if Joe or Seth wants to take a stab um, to get us started. And then I'd be happy to have other people jump in on this one too, because it's quite a big question. Yeah, let me let me take a, a start and Seth, feel free um, or, or not. <laughs> um, you hope so, Leanne, I think is the short answer. Um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Allison made the point on, you know, the, the crisis in 2007-8 and 2010-11 with the high prices is it did focus attention on productivity in Africa, in particular in other places of the world and the yield gaps and, and after, you know, years of not investing in, in productivity. And so hopefully those longer term issues you know, have continued, but as Allison points out, those the systems, you know, a lot could be done there. Um, but I think the immediate thing, so we're really talking about, well, what about, we remember back in 2007, eight, what happened was that a lot of countries um, said, oh, gee, high prices, uh, look what happens when we see high prices. We have our, our, you know, our citizens start having food riots and things like that. So you see a lot, you saw a lot of countries put on uh, export restrictions. Okay, let's keep the prices low at home so we won't export this. And what happens, and people talk about this analogy all the time, but it's like being at a, you know, a football game and the row in front of you stands up, everyone has to stand up behind you. And it's exactly what we saw in 2007, eight, particularly in, in the wheat market and the rice market, where you had a number of countries announcing bans or restrictions on exports of of rice and wheat. And that just exacerbates the, the situation. And it really penalizes the poor countries that can't afford the, 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 those commodities in the first place. So I would hope that, that whatever happens with over the next six, seven months, Charlotte already mentioned all the export bans that we see already on fertilizers. Um, you know, and we've already, as Seth mentioned, the, the export restrictions, uh, the, the taxes and other things on, on Russia wheat. This could you know, really accelerate into a very, very bad situation if we see that. I think it's very important to, 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 to for like what we saw in COVID, that, that initially we saw some actions, but then everyone started to relax and say, okay, the, the, the system is functioning. We are trying to, uh, you know, we are moving grain. And so I, that's to me the biggest concern right now is to see those sorts of adverse uh, actions that can really, uh, um, you know, look at what's going on in consumption of wheat. A lot of countries all of a sudden are saying, okay, we, we really need to buy forward now. And it's an understandable response, but that too puts pressure on prices. Over. Yeah, thanks very much, Joe. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pause for a minute to see if anyone else wants to jump in on this question of, about what are we better prepared? Um, but I'm not seeing the people on my screen that there's anyone who wants to jump in on this. 
Um, I have a, a few other questions related to fertilizer prices, Charlotte. So um, maybe I'll pick this one up. So could you tell us, are you aware of um, any good analyses that are specifically showing correlations between fertilizer prices, fertilizer use, um, food production and food security. So there's there's um, a couple of questions that are really linking to this question about do we have to worry about fertilizer price impacts in relation to food security? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, prices go up and some farmers will be more susceptible to higher prices than others, right? We, we said in the beginning that today we're looking at the global commodity prices, but there, it, it, of course we need to look at what's happening at the country level. So we will do a, a more detailed look at the fertilizer sector in, in as part of the seminar series, but farmers in countries that have also that benefit from higher crops, they can stomach those, those higher input uh, costs, right? But in many countries, you have farmers that are not plugged into big export value chains or, or established value chains. So they're producing perhaps for their local market or, or even subsistence farmers. For, for them, the, the price of fertilizers is gonna be prohibitive, right? Because they're not gonna see any increases in, in, their, crop, uh, in their crop prices. And then, then I think the other thing to think about is, is the sustainability question. So, so high prices in fertilizers clearly will be a threat to food security in my view. And yet, you know, maybe there is an argument to be made considering how much of the problem with, I mean, fertilizers are so important for, for global food security, and yet they are applied in such a way that is rather indiscriminate. So that a lot of the fertilizer is actually wasted that is applied to crops. And that's because it's not being applied in a very crop or site specific way. Uh, of course, improvements are being made uh, on this and, and fertilizer use efficiency is increasing, but you could argue, okay, higher prices might perhaps then get people to think more about reducing those nutrient losses to the environment. It's actually similar to the food loss and waste, right? We, we waste 30% of, of food and higher prices should actually focus us more on reducing that. Um, if we actually having an event on that topic tomorrow and the same on the fertilizer side, a lot of the fertilizer is wasted. So if prices go up, can we maybe get to a situation where we apply fertilizers in a more concerted way so that more nutrients are taken up by the crops and, and less um, uh, lost to the environment? And the last thing I want to say to this about this, you know, right now, fertilizer use is sort of dictated by price, right? If, if fertilizers are affordable, farmers will use it more. If crop prices go up, they'll use more fertilizers. But in an ideal world, we wouldn't look at fertilizer application in that way. We would we would apply fertilizers according to the agronomic needs of the plant and, and to the nutrient levels within the soils. So that's really ideally where we would be, but unfortunately that hasn't really been the case. Uh, uh, so perhaps things could change there. Thank you so much. Um, Arno, are you- may, uh, Yes, sorry. please. Can, can I say something? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just on the previous question of whether we are well prepared now to address the ongoing crisis, uh, the issue with crisis is that unfortunately they are very different. Crises never repeat themselves in the same form and uh, shape. And uh, while in the food crisis of uh, 2008, 9 and 11, uh, from what we all know, the previous speaker said, it was driven by a number of factors. Uh, that was one of them was biofuels, I would say, uh, other factors got to do with policy restrictions, etc. And we have learned from that. And that's fine. The problem with today's crisis, if you look at the energy market, for example, and I think that's a good example, is that the world has learned, in a sense, how to deal with an oil crisis. The problem, to, and in fact, the world is doing quite well. And you see that oil prices did increase, but not as much as they increased back in 2007, 2008, for a number of reasons, including investment in shale oil, diversification away from oil, and a number of other factors. The problem now is that we have an energy crisis that's completely different than what we had before. Now it's a crisis about coal, and the crisis related to natural gas. And the problem is that with natural gas, it was supposed to be the transition fuel that would get us from our, so to speak, addiction if I may use that term, on fossil, on fossil fuels, to a, to, to a place where we are 
less dependent on fossil fuels and we use more um, renewable energy sources. And this is the key difference here is that, yes, we have an energy crisis that's completely different than what we experienced in 2008. But even if we go back to th uh, 1979, which at least in my opinion is the one that resembles very well or is connected very well to the current circumstances, even that you see back then it was an oil crisis and today's uh, coal and the natural gas prices. So the short answer to the question is, no matter how much we learn, the next crisis is going to be completely different. That raises the question about preparedness, I guess. What do we need? What are the enabling conditions that help us be prepared to take action? So um, can I, I'll come back to you, Joe, in a second, because I see that Arnaud also wanted to comment on fertilizer markets, on the question that I posed to Charlotte, maybe. Um, fertilizer prices yes. and, yes, okay, over to you, yes, Arnaud. If I may, on, on wheat, because what we, we have seen, the, the balance sheet on wheat is very tight. and if we are even looking specifically on milling wheat, it's even more tight. So that means without nitrogen fertilizers, we don't have a milling wheat. I think we have to be clear also, we, we know that genetics research try to improve the situation, but it is right, I would say farmers, if they want to reach a level of quality to have this milling wheat, they will need to apply the, the fertilizer and fertilizer. We can discuss about best practices, but I think for the moment, and we are not expecting a a sharp increase of wheat production area for 22-23. That means the uh, application of fertilizer, irrelevant the price, I would say, will be very relevant if we want to try to balance that uh, that market on meaning wheat. So fully agree with Charlotte about when we talk about uh, fertilizer globally, but specifically meaning wheat here. Unfortunately, I think the price will not be the, the main driver because the farmers have to uh, secure some quality for to reach this market. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Joe, you wanted to hop in on biofuels, which sort of sits in between energy and <laughs> energy and commodities. So I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, no, thanks. And, and, and just two, two points. I think I think uh, Arno talked best about the, the wheat market, but it is important to remember that, you know, about 60 percent of the wheat is fall planted. So if there's not a lot you can do until planting times, you know, in summer and, and fall, the winter or the spring wheats you know, uh, if you if you count the what's coming out of the southern hemisphere is you know at, at that time of harvest, you know almost all of those are in pretty dry or areas where the variable or the weather is very highly variable. So it's all the more reason to be monitoring this with what Imbol does. The point I was going to make on uh, was responding to John's thing about biofuels, and I think that I would agree with John certainly in, insofar as the ethanol concerns that were were raised that. Uh, back then but you know on the other hand every little every metric ton of grain right now is tight and so uh, i think those debates are still going to happen and when you turn to vegetable oils there you it's very definitely a big impact on vegetable oil prices 40 percent or 41 percent of the uh, soybean oil production in the u.s goes to biodiesel production um, look at palm oil. Palm oil, uh, there's 30% blending requirements in Indonesia right now for uh, uh, palm oil or biodiesel into the diesel fuel supply. And it's in part one of the reasons why there's current, currently export restrictions uh, out of Indonesia. So these things are still very much impact. So I think we, we still have those debates, although I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with John that these are very different markets than um, and, and are very different crises and, and they need to be treated accordingly. Thanks a lot, Joe. Can I just stick with you for a second? Because I had two people ask a question that's very specific. I think it's a quick answer. Um, it has to do with a statistic that you had in, I think, a blog and maybe included in your presentation that Russia and Ukraine exports account for about 12% of total calories, calories traded. Yeah. Um, could you tell us where that number comes from? Sure. Uh, and and uh, unfortunately, my colleague, David Laborde, who's been doing a lot of work uh, uh, with me over the last uh, uh, several weeks on, on this, uh, he's the source of that data. And what David does is he uses uh, nutritional coefficients from USDA, from FAO, and converts uh, agricultural exports into calories. And so there are just these are coefficients that are applied and it's it's one way to give a, a to be able to kind of sum up 
and summarize a lot of the exports in terms of calorie content. We also do it for fat content and protein content and other sorts of things. But the uh, uh, again, it's you you can imagine the bulk of those calories are going to be in things like grains and 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 staple products. But but we do calculate it across the broad range of of uh, uh, agricultural products that are exported. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Um, I want to come back on this issue of transparency um, in ball to you, because, of course, when I look at the information that um, GeoGlam is pulling together and the great kind of images and um, all the synthesis and analysis that goes into that, I can see the investments. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you from where you sit, you see gaps in terms of where new investments could actually have a big improvement in terms of how we are, how we're doing our monitoring are there are there directions um, where investment in that kind of transparency would help yeah sure great thanks and i think um you know one of the the main areas where satellite data can really help us is when once the crop is in the ground and before it's harvested right so when you have that information gap um, and satellites can are monitoring on a daily basis we can see almost every field really across the world um, but, you know, to, to develop models, especially when we're talking about quantitative models, whether it is to map um, crop types so that we can get at estimates of, of area, um, or whether it is to do yield forecasting and ultimately, you know, combining those to get at production, a lot of what we need um, are ground measurements, right? So it's never going to completely replace all your ground measurements, but we need to be able to pair that satellite data with the data from the ground so that you know, when we say this is what corn looks like, um, that we can correlate that when the satellite data and develop models that can then, you know, identify all the very ways that that corn might look like and and be able to, to produce these kinds of maps. So there's a lot of work in this space and being able to utilize whatever ground observations we have in order to um, be able to use these and, and generalize models. Um, and also equally as important is to be able to validate these models. And, and so when you put out a number, you put out a map or an information product to be able to provide some uncertainty around that. Um, because otherwise I think we're also increasingly seeing with more availability of these technologies and satellite data, a lot more products in that space. Um, but I think a lot of, you know, what we really need to be moving more and more on, and, and we're seeing this, is moving from this research side into operations. And so I think we're continuously to advance and develop the capabilities on the research side. And it's really important at the same time to be able to move those in the direction that's actually needed. And I think a lot of this work with GeoGlam and with Amis has actually really helped to do this and make sure that ministries of agriculture are utilizing these technologies and utilizing them to the best way that, that they can. And so that um, and you're making these as accessible as possible so that not, you know, each each crop analyst now has to become a remote sensing specialist, but really be able to to look at uh, as um, how can we transition these kinds of capabilities and then even more so into countries that that um, I think, you know, ground surveys are very expensive. And so um, being able to to look at how do you best target your ground surveys, right? So satellite data can help you make those a lot more efficient. And then in countries that have a need for better monitoring, um, being able to transition these kinds of technologies into operational um, spaces within ministries of agriculture so that we're getting these kinds of information also from, from countries. So I think there's um, there's been tremendous progress in terms of our capabilities. And I think we're seeing that. And I think the fact that we're getting so many requests also means that there's so much more awareness to the capabilities that satellite data can provide. Um, but there's certainly a lot of technology and capabilities have already been developed that can really be transitioned now and, and taken up um, in more operational senses. Yeah, I really like your response to that because a lot of times there's just so much data, it's almost impossible to use it. <laughs> so having the value added of having having it put together in a way, like you said, where there can be an operational decision, I think there's a really high value added to that. Um, we have about 15 minutes left and I wanna make sure everyone gets a chance to answer a question. So I'd like to come back um, to Allison. Is she still on the call? Yes, okay. I'm here, Leon. Great. Um, the, in your in your presentation, this is a little bit of a sideways um, question from where we just were, but you had a, a reference to the question of the fragmentation of the landscape, and I thought of it as the fragmentation in the innovation landscape, in a sense that there's lots of different actors um, and 
And in order to actually get change moving in a direction where you want it to go, for example, in your space, which is around um, crop, um, crop modification and new, creating new crops, how do you address that kind of fragmentation? Like what are the practical, practical solutions to trying to move people in a coherent direction? Yeah, thanks, thanks, and, and it's a great question, and obviously a big question for the, the sector as a whole. Uh, and I think Yo mentioned that in his introduction, the, the need for collaboration uh, across this space. I, I think if we look at what we've learned, we can we can also kind of see the context for, for the current fragmentation of the landscape. Uh, as, as Joe pointed out, the, the focus on productivity has been on, on supply. Uh, nitrogen, likewise, fertilizers has been about supply, and I and I think we have seen a decoupling of the demand and su supply and demand elements, uh, both at the plant level. You know, not not using the plant to, to understand how much nitrogen to apply, um, not not really targeting that supply to what a farmer or a farming system specifically needs, and then when we talk about dietary diversity, behavioral change, not even really understanding at the level of the the society, how that society wants to shift its behavioral dietary patterns from wheat to rice or, or, or minor cereals or, or food blends uh, and the consumer demand side of it. And um, so I think when we focus on supply, it's very easy to have this fragmentation of the landscape to just say we need productivity, that's plant breeding, we need plant health, that's that's agrochemicals, we need fertilizer, we need we need to stabilize price, that's fertilizer, you know, at a specific price point. Uh, but I think we we are starting to see the the power of looking at, at through a more demand-driven lens and then and, and then that naturally brings a, a greater coherence because if you're saying we need to know what a farmer wants in order to provide a, a better variety through a, a higher functioning seed system, you know, as a plant breeder, I can't go to a farmer and, and fully appreciate the, the demand side of it. Um, and so then um, we, we have a challenge where we, we really have to have that challenge as a, as a cross-disciplinary uh, purpose, both in terms of the economics, the, the social behavioral side of it. Uh, so I think it's really about flipping that, that thinking from, from the supply side to, to the demand drivers, uh, particularly in the space that, that I work in more on the biophysical side. What, what, do, what do societies, individuals, uh, farmers, uh, the, the agricultural system want? Uh, and then how do we, we build those solutions? Uh, and that will, will, of course, come with solutions that are, that are cross-disciplinary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is something we've also been thinking a lot about at the OECD, which is sort of um, the private sector innovation in terms of thinking about what consumers want and all these new technologies that are being generated in the private sector in terms of um, linking products to, to how they are produced, for example, so that consumers can make some choices around what, how they want to how they want to spend their money vis-a-vis -vis environmental goals, for example. Now, there's a question here, and I'm not sure anyone will be able to answer it, but I'll pose it anyway, which is, um, has anyone on this panel had, um, have been working on modeling what the impacts of the sanctions might be or are likely to be on global and food, global food and agriculture? Um, I'm not sure, I'm sure that there are people working on this, but I'm not sure that people on this call are working on that kind of thing. Joe, do you want to say something? Yeah, no, I, 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 uh, if pre colleagues, uh, David Laborde had, had, has done some work on this with, with Antoine Boet, and uh, they looked at the 2007, 2008 crisis, uh, if I remember correctly, Will Martin, uh, who's also an if pre uh, 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 colleague who, who had been at the World Bank, who did a paper with Kim Anderson on this, uh, a, f a few years ago, and they found that a lot of uh, their findings, if I remember correctly, and I, I can't give you the exact numbers, but uh, a, a, a large percent of the increase that we saw in those spikes in 2007-8, if I if I remember their research correctly, was you know 30 to 40 percent of that uh, was uh, due to those restrictions. So again, you can make a bad situation very very worse. Uh, very much worse by by putting on restrictions, uh, but but certainly if someone wants to contact me, I can uh, uh, dig up those studies, or or you can better yet put you in contact with the authors. Great, um, I have a question. So there's lots of questions. I won't be able to get through them all. I apologize to people who are on the call, but there's one on trade, and I'd like to pose it as it's written and get some reaction. Um, the question is. 
Have countries gotten addicted to trade? And if so, is this a call for more self-sufficiency? And I'm thinking there's probably several people who could comment. Charlotte, over to you. Yeah, I mean, it is certainly, that's a question that I think people are asking. And, and I mean, my personal view on this is, you know, we do need to make sure that countries are producing what they are able to produce. Um, but I think moving towards full self-sufficiency is, is certainly not a good uh, a good path to follow. And, and just specifically on fertilizers, we have to remember that uh, unfortunately, when especially when it comes to potash and phosphate, there's not every country has that in their soils, right? And 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 you can only mine it uh, in in certain regions and very limited regions. Now, ammonia is a little easier because you need natural gas, but even there, of course, you have sort of comparative advantages, right? Natural gas has been historically cheaper in some regions than in others. It, it shifts, of course. I mean, the U.S. has become a major ammonia producer, even though, you know, 10 years ago, the nitrogen industry in the US was actually declining. And that's because of, uh, of shale gas. So, so we need to keep in mind that there are, first of all, physical limitations as to what you can produce where, and then there are also these price variations, and there is always going to be some comparative advantages. And that, of course, is, is what makes trade such an important uh, vehicle. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Joe, I see you, and then John, and then Arno. I think so. Joe first. Yeah, well, I've probably talked way too much already, but but yeah, no, I think that that I mean, it's one thing to talk about increasing productivity, and that's something I think broad based that people can agree, particularly in those regions where we see large yield gaps. But but to embark on a, a you know policy of self sufficiency, I think is just uh, fraught with all sorts of problems. One is it's costly. And even, even there, you particularly when you're in regions where the weather's highly variable, look at Morocco, which has been, uh, you know, uh, has, has talked at times about self-sufficiency. They're in a huge drought right now and need a lot of wheat. And so the, in those periods of time, you need uh, to bring in uh, a lot of wheat. And then there's just some countries where it's just, it's, it's just totally infeasible. I mean, you look at the big population centers in North Africa, like Egypt or so, they just can't grow enough wheat for themselves. Never would, you know, at this level, they, they are highly dependent on imports. And so, um, uh, yeah, I, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, John, would you like to comment on this? Yes, uh, just a small comment. I fully agree with uh, the previous speaker, John Charlotte, that you cannot move to full self-sufficiency. And uh, regarding the questions of the previous, of the, uh, the person that asked the question, I mean, if we are addicted to trade, I mean, it's difficult to define addiction. But I wouldn't be surprised if we see a move towards uh, less trade down the road. And uh, that's going to take place not only in agriculture, but I would say in energy commodities as well, and probably in energy commodities in a much uh, bigger way. And I would also like to highlight the fact that this trend, I don't think it starts uh, now with uh, the conflict, with the uh, war in uh, Ukraine. I think it started with COVID-19, and especially from the manufacturing sector, and we all, or most of us know the examples of uh, uh, computer chips, how they are concentrated in a couple of two or three companies that account the majority of computer chips around the world. And many countries, uh, they would like to, to kind of uh, have uh, diverse sources. So I think the conclusion is, uh, the bottom line is that uh, regardless of uh, how one thinks about whether we're addicted or not, uh, there will be a lot of moves on uh, less trade and probably more self-sufficiency, self towards self-sufficiency. But of course, we have the, the issues that uh, Joe and Charlotte uh, made that not all countries can produce anything. Thank you very much. Arno, are you still with us? You said you would like to jump in to make a comment on the grains value chain question. Yes, also what we are seeing with the COVID-19 uh, also disruption, that's all the grain sector. It's not just about uh, the commodity, the raw commodity as we are talking, but there is a, a lot of semi-processed products which are trading around and which is in organizing this global uh, trade. So therefore the global, the grain value chain is much more complex. 
And when we start to, to touch one part and just look what's happening in, in Brazil, for example, when they try to develop uh, more biodiesel production from uh, from soybean, now they need also to think how to what to do with the soy meal. So you see this increasing complex uh, system. So uh, self-sufficiency is not necessarily the, the answer to that. And indeed, with the matter, we are talking about market volatility. I think we have two main drivers we have to keep in mind is more you have exporters on your market, more stability you might have, first of all, because you might have some alternatives. And the second point is also um, about um, the size of your market. If we have a market which is only dedicated to food, you have a smaller size and you, have, you, have, you are more exposed to shocks. If you have a market where you integrate food, industrial use, and feed, then you increase your size of your market. And that's mean your uh, ability to respond to shock is better. And I think this is why the global trade is important, is indeed not just to limit, I would say your size on your industry or your food uh, purposes, because when we talk about uh, self-sufficiency is for food. So you limit your size. And when, as Joe said, you have a uh, climate event, your market take a big hit. So that's very important to, to, to take into consideration this global trade is not just about food, but it's more complex uh, product and which try to, uh, to compensate these different uh, variation in, in yields uh, uh, times to times. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're, we're to the point where we should be wrapping up. It's been a really interesting uh, to our discussion. I would really like to thank all the panelists who were with us with all the detailed information um, in this moment when, um, when the world seems to be changing really rapidly in uncertain ways. It's, it's really a luxury to be able to spend two hours with people like this who can share um, deep information about, uh, about what's going on. And we talked about the importance of transparency. So I hope um, the people who joined the call feel like they have more information themselves to think about what's going on in the world. Um, and I personally appreciated wrapping up on this trade question because I think this is um, really key, partly because um, as we, when we started out in the Q&A, we had some comments about the importance of making sure that we try to avoid disruptions to markets um, beyond what's already there. So uh, um, anyway, I'll just say thank you again to everyone who, who spoke. Thank you for those presentations. And as a wrap up, um, I would just like to tell the people who joined us for this event that at IFPRI um, tomorrow, there's another event on March 10th at 9.30 um, Eastern Standard Time on SDG 12.3, which is related to food loss and food waste. Um, and the title is Food Loss and Food Waste, a Once-in-Generation Opportunity. And this is co-organized by IFPRI and the Embassy of Denmark. So um, I hope everyone can join IFPRI there for that event. Um, and with that, uh, I wrap up, um, wishing everybody a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs>